Good evening. Um, so welcome to the low residency MFA in visual studies um, visiting lecture series. I'm very, very happy to have Suhail Malik here. But I also wanted to make a couple of announcements for the, the upcoming things going on. Um, next week, Wednesday, July 11th at 6 p.m., Beatriz Santiago Munoz is here. She'll give next week's um, visiting lecture. Um, and there's also uh, another lecture that, that we're co-organizing with Homeschool. It'll be at AL Union. It's Alexandria Aregbu. Uh, and that is uh, Friday, July 13th at 6 p.m. Um, there's also an opening at Third Space. That's 707 Northeast Broadway, or just uh, uh, just Google Third Space Portland, and it should come up. It's expanding, expanding expanded cinema, curated by Nicole Baker and Kaya Mallory. So that's going to be awesome. Um, also, uh, an alumni show that's Saturday, July 14th, here at PNCA. Works by alumni of the Low Rise Visual Studies Program, curated by Nicole Baker and Vanessa England. Gallery 157 here. Um, and there's also First Thursday. That's this Thursday. So there's action-packed um, stuff coming up. But anyway, let's get to the lecture. And there's a, a brief um, introduction. So thanks for coming. Thank you, Aaron. Good evening. Suhail Malik is a co-director of the MFA Fine Art Goldsmith London, where he holds a readership in critical studies and was 2012-15 visiting faculty at CCS Baird, New York. With this evening's lecture, Suhail will elaborate how and why the current common transformation of art and capital accumulation together is underway and what is required of art if, on one hand, is not to adopt reactive formations against this combined process, while also, on the other hand, art is to now invent effective counterproposals to the new predations of capital accumulation, predations encouraged, supported by contemporary art itself. Suhail's publications, among many, include The Flood of Rights, on the necessity of art's exit from contemporary art, genealogies of speculation, the time complex, post-contemporary, as co-editor, realism, materialism, art, why art, the primary of audience, primacy of audience, excuse me, and you are here. So an honor and a pleasure to welcome Suhail Malik to PNCA and to Portland. Thank you, Suhail, from all of us here present and future. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, I, I haven't quite written all of those things that you said, uh, but I'm happy to take the credit. Um, and thank you, Aaron, for the invitation um, and the hospitality as well, also to Alejandra and, and Agnes. And also thanks to Aaron for getting me here and all the hard work that involves. Um, so basically what I'm going to talk about this evening, um, as Bob's uh, previewed, is the way in which contemporary art supports um, current forms of uh, capital accumulation, uh, even as it claims not to, which is the standard sort of critical claim of, of contemporary art as, as a critical practice. Um, but this is quite a complicated and uh, an intricate um, argument because it's a complicated and intricate engagement between contemporary art and capital domination. Um, so uh, it's just too bad <laughs> that it's that complicated. I'll try my best to uh, keep it straightforward as I'm going along. All right, so retrotransfiguration of the commonplace in the title partially cites the American philosopher Arthur C. Danto, whose basic claim for the art operation is the distance art sets up from everyday or commonplace apprehension. A snow shovel, if you're Duchamp, Brillo boxes, if you're Warhol, potted plants, if you do post-internet art, YouTube videos and ideas, if you do any art whatsoever now. All of these are treated differently when they're taken as art as opposed to how they take place in the commonplace, right? So art is this distance taking, as Danto calls it. So in Dan or as Danto puts it in his signature phrase, art is the transfiguration of the commonplace. And for Danto, 
The characteristic difference of art from the commonplace involves interpretation. Commonplace engagement follows more or less well-established or routine formats. You just get on with it. But artworks are subject to interpretation. When you engage a snow shovel or a potted plant in an artwork, it means something different to its commonplace placement. It's the interpretation means that the artwork is open, multiple, partial, and individualized in its meaning and meaning making. You have to be creative, not just to make the work, but also to engage with the work. And that's the difference with the commonplace. Such a distance taking from the commonplace through this process of uh, constant creativity in the art field through interpretation is an important result for positions that are critical of prevailing power. And if social totality is now subjugated to processes of capital extraction, capitalist extraction, with all the things that is taken to mean, standardization, regionization, displacement, extraction, alienation, and so on, such that the commonplace is in fact only an index or a venue for domination by capital, then art's distance from the commonplace provides an important uh, point of separation from capital domination. And this is the standard claim for contemporary art, critical art, as, as an anti-domination undertaking, all right? or a kind of, it's automatically a criticism or critique of capital domination. But the citation, um, the partial citation of the title, the retro transfiguration of the commonplace, is also a reversal of Danto's premise. And most of this talk is directed to demonstrating this point, that contrary to contemporary art's standard political claims, this reversal of art's specific operation, the retro transfiguration of the commonplace, now validates current forms of capital accumulation against previous formats of capitalism. All right? So contemporary art is supporting current forms of capitalism against previous forms of capitalism. So capitalism is a multiple thing. And one form of capitalism can uh, critique previous forms of capitalism. And in order to, for that, it, and it critiques previous forms of capitalism in order to continue having justification in terms of current, um, current uh, virtues, current notions of what counts as okay and what is justifiable. And the argument is contemporary art supports current forms of capitalism against previous forms of capitalism. And the argument then is heavily indebted to the work of Luke Boltanski and Eve Capello in the book, The New Spirit of Capitalism. The core argument is basically that the commonplace of capitalism is itself now aligned with and reproduces the kinds of engagement that contemporary art once took for its own. Okay. So that's um, the straightforward claim, trying to demonstrate this claim. Uh, we'll take the next hour or so. Uh, you could go home if like, you have convinced by this. Uh, it's a nice sunny day. Uh, but I'd be pleased if you stayed. So in short, another way to put this claim is that you'll find something like art just about everywhere where capitalism is converting to new modes of accumulation. Okay? I was saying earlier in a workshop that we were doing, it's no accident, for example, that PNCA is located here in a, in a site of obvious redevelopment with intensive capital speculation, okay? because it's an art and design college. And that's actually fundamental to what development now has to be. So art is just about everywhere where capitalism is converting to new modes of accumulation, and art is a channel by which new methods of capital accumulation are channeled. Right? Which is also to say that the usual worries and critiques about capital, capital domination, meaning standardization, now miss the point, precisely because art, uh, art validates non-standardization. Uh, it validates difference from standardization. It validates deroutinization. And insofar as art supports current forms of capital accumulation, capital itself is no longer interested in standardization. But to get to that claim, two aspects to this retro transfiguration of art into the commonplace need to be first elaborated. First, uh, we need to elaborate this, this retro transfiguration once from within historical institutions of art and historical understandings of contemporary art, uh, which I'll call CA. Yeah? And the other uh, so transformation we need to understand is from outside of the historical venues of art. So firstly, a report from the inside. 
After many two years of teaching in art schools in the United States, Lane Relia, who teaches, I think, in Northwestern in Chicago, Lane Relia notes a significant change in how, in the early years of the 21st century, artists now speak about what they do contrasted to previous generations. He says, when I first started teaching college art courses in the early 1980s, it would often be in painting departments, and I, like everyone else, would assign articles from the 1960s addressing topics like the difference between modernist medium specificity and conceptualism's art in general. And I would ask the painting students how they would identify themselves if someone asked them in a bar in court, what do you do? Would they call themselves painters or artists? Most back then answered, I'm a painter in the 1980s. I've continued to ask this question. Today, the painting students, and he's choosing painting because it's like the art form, right? Today, the painting students, all of them across the board, don't say they're paint painters, but they do also don't call themselves artists. I do stuff is the most frequent response. So I make stuff, all verb, no predicate, all open-ended uh, open adaptability and responsiveness, no set vocation. So as well as the liberalization of what my account is art, stuff, I do stuff, also indexes how weak art's categorical distinction is from everything else, even to the point of vanishing such that the word and category of art seem outdated. Okay? I think there's something very, very important going on when art students who paint say that they do stuff. It's not even that the term painting or art suffice, but stuff making is going on. Uh, and I think this is a world historical shift in what we understand art to be about. The very thing that distances art from the rest of the social totality that makes art specifically, that makes for art specifically, is abandoned by Raelia students. And I don't think they're unusual in this. Raelia students articulate very clearly a broader shift in artistic identification. What has made, sorry, what was made as art is now the commonplace, stuff. The distinct notion of art is extinguished. This fatalistic extinguishing of art by and as stuff, however, I think assumes too much. Or rather, it assumes too little about what, commonplace, about what the commonplace stuff now is. So it's one thing for art students to say they make stuff, and that seems to collapse the distance of art from the commonplace stuff. But the question is, what is happening with stuff in the commonplace? Right? It's not what it used to be. Stuff, recall, has been another name for routinized, anonymous, desubjectivized commonplace that art used to distinguish itself from by virtue of its own subjective validation, creativity, interpretation, and so on. But for the students Relia speaks of, stuff making is not happening outside of art schools. It's not happening outside of art, but is the term for what emerging artists do in art schools. Right? So it's art making as stuff or stuff making as art. The lesson, I think, is that stuff making is a kind of artistic endeavor, even if it is not called art as such. What used to be called art and what used to be gained from art is now undertaken through stuff without the need for categorical specificity that art has historically demarcated, right? the distance taking that Danto says defines defines art uh, and contemporary art. As much as the commonplace is a uh, transfiguration, so rather, as much as art is a, is a transfiguration of the commonplace, exactly the opposite sense, uh, oh, sorry, let, let, me, let me rehearse this, okay? If stuff making is a kind of artistic endeavor, it means that the commonplace is a transfiguration of art, right? And that's exactly the opposite of Danto's definition of art. And what's crucial to understand here is that artistic activity as stuff making does not then index the degradation or diminishment of art to routinized commonplace. Rather, it indexes that the commonplace is itself a venue for, was, for what was historically to be obtained in and by art, all right? So this is a kind of dialectical move or a kind of reversal. As much as artists, young artists, emerging artists now say they make stuff, which is a name for commonplace stuff, it's also the case that stuff is now doing the kinds of things that art used to do, art exclusively used to do. Right, so it's, a, it's not 
there's a reversal, but there's shared attributes between stuff in the commonplace and art. We don't need the categorical specificity of art to do the things that art specifically used to do, because it's happening everywhere. So as much as, uh, yeah, okay. This, this is the retro transfiguration, the retro transfiguration of the commonplace identified in the title of the talk. What we then need to do is pay attention to stuff. What is, what is happening with stuff that fulfills some of the demands or imperatives that used to be exclusive to art? And I think we can just do this descriptively. To apprehend this retro transfiguration of the commonplace um, that was once distinct from art but now isn't, what is happening artistically outside of art, the external transformation, um, of arts, at least of arts conventionally established venues needs, establ needs elaboration. The relatively new artistic, or if you prefer proto-artistic or quasi-artistic formations of the commonplace can, I think, be made clearer by elaborating four recent significant transformations of the broader social configuration, each of which format new channels of capital accumulation. So the, the, added, the added claim now is that the transformation of stuff to do the kinds of things that art used to do isn't just a change in what stuff is, but that, that these are new, new channels, new venues, new opportunities for capital accumulation. So it's not an innocent move. It's deeply ingrained within transformations of political economy. So the first of these venues is the commodity. While consumption can always be taken to be a demonstration of taste, it's now also a demonstration of care, Dem uh, a demonstration of care to oneself, of care to others, of care to the environment, recycling. And as a demonstration of care, consumption is also then uh, about, um, is, is, is not only about the satisfaction of needs. What we uh, now do through consumption is something closer to fashion rather than utility, closer to sustainability, not resource extraction. It's closer to demonstrating an alertness to responsibilities, not to cost reductions. Diversification, not st stabilization of cultural identifiers through music, literature, and clothes. Right? We show that we're interesting, curious people interested in the planet and others through our consumption, not just to serving our own ends. In broad terms, the object of consumption is a signifier of quality and concern. What is consumed is the design feature, not use, but design. Design engages a subject, requiring them to interpret what the commodity and the consumption of it means, how it feels, the tactile, the affective, and what it signifies. From innovations in material conditions, faster Wi-Fi, organic food markets, to functional processes, what kind of cloud server do you go with, what's the energy consumption, how do you grade them in terms of various ratings, to branding, the higher grade smartphone with rounder edges and so on, the design feature differentiates specific elements, processes, or stylizations as distinct pre-made channels for navigating the competing solution to quality-based consumption. And on the side of the subject, consumption is now the demonstration of the subject's each time singular cognitive affective navigation of the complex configuration of social options. When you make a choice in the vast range, which is actually quite narrow, of smartphones, uh, where you go, where you do your grocery shopping and so on and so forth, you're not just making a choice for what you consume, you're also demonstrating something to yourself and others about your place on the planet. Right? You signify, and you signify care as well as use. You navigate a terrain which is symbolic, uh, in, uh, sort of to do with um, investments in terms of sustainability, for example, um, and also in terms of selfhood and identification of yourself. All of this is a demonstration of a kind of creativity happening every day, all the time. It's a creativity made by the subject to itself, or a demonstration made of, of creativity made by the subject, both a demonstration to oneself, but also a demonstration to others simultaneously, 
it's a way of engaging in a, what Richard Florida calls a creative class. And this is the second form of transformation of stuff that I think we can identify, which is the transformation to community. In Richard Florida's words, the creative class is a highly individualized and even atomized social stratum. Its members are concerned primarily with personal betterment, staying fit, developing themselves, renovating their houses and apartments, questing after new experiences. And if you look at the last, uh, if you look at all of them apart from staying fit, personal betterment, developing themselves, renovating houses and apartments, questing after new experiences, well, contemporary art does all of those things. Right? So it's actually a good venue through which uh, members of the creative class can sort of uh, enact their creativity as consumers. Yet their values, our values, shift, Florida says, shift from meeting immediate material needs to stressing belonging, self-expression, opportunity, environmental quality, diversity, community, and quality of life, which is the point I was making earlier about the commodity. But all of this latter stuff are ethical and social gains rather than material acquisition. Okay? And this is really, really important for the creative class. But there's a near contradiction within Florida's description between, on the one hand, individuated self-development, which is about oneself and one's own growth as a person, and, on the other hand, common responsibility. Right. But it's not a contradiction. The, the sort of polar configuration between self and common responsibility is, is resolved by a specific kind of network social composition supporting a relational individuation, relational individuation that Lane Relia uh, also identifies quite well. R Relia says relational individuation, sorry, network, network social composition places too much stress on the importance of relations, interactions, and feedback to overly isolate individuals from each other or overly circumscribe their interdependence within predetermined rules. So the th important thing about networks is you have to network, which means how you develop as an individual in a network and why people might look to you and not someone else depends on how you network, which is to say what your relationships to others are. So network sociality is a way of resolving what has been thought of as a contradiction or an opposition between selfhood, individuation, and sociality. Uh, Relia continues, network subjects are viewed as neither under nor over-socialized. It's like a Goldilocks type of selfhood, right? Neither under nor over-socialized, neither autonomous nor entirely indoctrinated, neither bracketed from nor reducible to institutional determinants. Because with a network, you're dependent upon an institution, which is the network. It doesn't have to be you know, made of bricks and bricks and mortar and the rest of it. An institution, a network is kind of mobile institutional form. Um, so you're in an institution, but also you're a network actor who stands for specific things in the network. So you're institutionalized, uh, but also you're somewhat independent from the institution in your, independ in your, in your individuality. So to conclude the, the quotation from earlier, um, this network sociality demonstrates how networks show relative disregard for isolating boundaries. And this is about person-to-person -person interactions, but I think we can add that isolating boundaries are disregarded not just at that level. Network socialization also has the advantage of coupling place-bound circumstances with the highly transnationalized horizons of employment, socialization, information streams, culture, and identifications in which the creative class not only operates, but by which it also constructs itself. We don't have to look very far to see this in action. This is a description of the contemporary art world. If you're in contemporary art, even if you don't go anywhere, you're part of a transnationalized network in which what's important is the demonstration of an individualized production, which is individualized through interactions with the network. Okay. So the network construction can then be seen um, as to be as global as it is local, or even more so, a member of the creative class in one part of the world is more likely to identify and engage with someone in that class from another part of the world than with someone from, say, the rural population of where they live or non-creative areas of their own cities. It's kind of extremely 
uh, common, common condition nowadays. A global network, uh, a global network relational individuation can only succeed thanks to the transnational cosmopolitan sociality that it once presumes and constructs. Okay? So as, a, as an act in a transnational network, you have more in common with others in the transnational network, no matter where they may be, than with people down the road or places outside of the cities in which these networks are concentrated. Which brings us to the third point, the city. This, this kind of design-led consumption and network socialization are in practice lifestyle decisions that construct the subject's selfhood for others and also for each subject themselves. And key to lifestyle is one of the most tangible successes of the recent recomposition of capital accumulation, which is of course gentrification of deindustrialized and poorer zones of major cities, and here we are. Right. But this is not at all unusual or specific. It's just a common place of where talks like this happen. The historical paradigm for this recomposition is the conversion of Soho in Manhattan into high and mixed use zones between the 70s and the 90s. The, the by now familiar model of art led gentrification is that artists seeking out the studio spaces, housing, social infrastructure commensurate to low incomes of part time work, which many artists and other creatives commit to in order to gain the time to be active as artists. Um, all of this leads to a kind of uh, culturally led investment, which is also a kind of uh, capitalization of those very areas. The cultural reinvigoration of city spaces consequent to artists entering into them because of their low, their low rents and low costs draws in increased capital investments over time. This is not news. Um, sorry, I just lost my place. Um, okay. The political aspect of this conversion process is that the continual reformation of identities and subjecthood promoted by contemporary art especially in its critical demands, because art is critical insofar as it says transformation is to be validated. Right? Unfixing is the, is the demand of contemporary art. This, promote, this reformation of identities and subjecthood counters the spatial fixing of modern socio-political categories such as class, ethnicity, religion, income level, employment, and so on, all of which characterize the ind industrial city. So artistic critical conversion of cities doesn't just change them in terms of um, incomes and, and um, uh, economic development. It also transforms the socio-economically organized city into one of flexible, mobile, and diverse identities, which is a civic virtue for the cosmopolitan city. Okay, if you want a cosmopolitan city, you want an unfixing of identities. You want people to be relaxed with encountering diversity. And art's very good at promoting those values against traditional forms of cities through, uh, organized through industrialization, which were quite demarcated and bounded and segmented. So art's doing important work in cosmopolitizing cities through gentrification. It's a gentrification, as I said, not just in terms of income levels, but also gentrification of civility, if you want, right? cosmopolitan civility. And this, in turn, is a key element of cities' branding strategies in the global or regional competition to attract mobile capital and jobs, especially that of a tax-paying middle class, who are now not disparaged as a deadening bourgeoisie, but endorsed as an enlivening creative class. As the mobilization of the interests of the art field by property developers and the city government demonstrates, the urban expansion of the interests of art, and of contemporary art in particular, are now, now promotes the standard formats of design-led consumption in these zones. And so the fourth category, the subject. The resetting of the social composition of the commonplace through consumption, through community, and cities each and together coherently serve the characteristic subject of the creative class, who is at the focus, who is the focus of all of these conversion processes, right? So each of the previous three are organized by uh, endorsing, emphasizing, and giving primacy to, sub to subjectivity one is always endorsed as a subject if you go through the modern, through the, through the creative, through the creative city, 
The community, if you remember, is that of a network sociality in which the subject is both institutionalized but also identifies themselves to be individuated away from the um, constraining formats of the institutions. And the commodity is a design feature in which your own experience determines the meaning and significance of the commodity to yourself and to others. The subject is always at the core of these processes, right? And it's not a routinized and standardized subject, it's an individualized and creative subject. As a network actor, the subject must be open to the contingencies, opportunities, and threats visited upon it by the networks that it is engaged in. The relational individual is, must be adaptable, flexible, responsive, and receptive. These characteristics advance and are advanced as a cosmopolitanism, which shapes as it also enables infrastructures and lifestyle patterns of the urban setting that sanctions new formats of commonly individuated experiences. Okay, commonly individuated experiences. They, we, are thoughtful, receptive to others, responsive to new circumstances, and capable of producing meanings and counter-readings in any situation. Clever. All of this can, however, only be maintained if the subject is generative of and amenable to changes of structure and meaning, to revisions in ideas, material conditions, environments, a receptivity to peoples and cultures. You have to be prepared to deal with the new if you're going to be in this condition. Okay, this condition is the condition of being able to deal with the new and transform and adapt. Such a subject is intrinsically communitarian so long as the community is networked, which is to say that the community is actively made and remade revisionary and dislocating, all of which is unique to each individual who is thereby further individuated by their network activity. I think it's worth adding in a note, as a side note, uh, maybe for discussion as well, that the reaction to this condition, because it involves displacement of people who used to live in cities in segmented blocks, it involves a separation of the venues of network sociality from areas which don't participate in it, the cities against the rural spaces, I'm sure you all understand the kind of political consequences of this. The reaction to this condition is, of course, an anti-cosmopolitanism, which takes the shape of various kinds of identitarian formation, including nationalism, including economic nationalism, which is then coherently in alliance with a kickback against this recent intensified concentration of capital in urban centers. So the alliance between economic nationalism and people left behind in rural areas, or people from cities in which have been reorganized away from their traditional formats, makes sense in terms of this logic of expanding network sociality. That kickback, in some ways, is a, a reaction to the retro transfiguration of the commonplace. Okay, but I'll leave that as a parenthetical note, um, which I'm hopeful will generate some discussion. So these are, these are kind of specific channels for the conversion of stuff. Uh, all of these things were at one time in the critique of modernism understood to be repressive, uh, limiting, constraining, standardizing, and routinizing. They're now understood as venues and channels for uh, subjective individuation, okay? but also a kind of open, flexible, adaptable community of subjective individuation. But the, let's get to the general point. Beyond these specific, and return back to art specifically, beyond these particular channels of the retro transfiguration of the complex, and there are others, but these seem to me the, the most prominent ones, the general point is that the network subject's activity is a creative and transformative praxis of making new meanings and revising old ones. Making new meanings and revising old ones. Well, what does that very well? Contemporary art. The specific point is twofold. Firstly, the general characteristic of the network subject is constructed through a combination of cognitively engaged consumption, which I'll signify with the C, organized via decorative elements of the design feature, D, both of which are central to the network composition of sociality, S. I call this the um, cognitive, decorative, social composition 
of network sociality and subject together, CDS. All right, let's go through it again because it's a little bit uh, intense. Um, so the network sociality, you have to think your way through things, right? So there's a cognitive engagement, but that cognitive engagement is happening through the design feature, for example, in consumption, right? That's one aspect of it. Um, but because it's happening through the design feature, so the object and what the object is and how it signifies and what it means in relationship to other objects is how one sort of sub, sub individuates oneself. You make a choice between this phone with this kind of rounded edge against that phone with that kind of camera, okay, with the various plans involved. All of that selection is a form of individuation. And that's the D moment, but all of that is a type of, um, uh, is a type of indi individuation through network sociality, which is the S moment. All right, so that's the CDS, the CDS format. So that's the that's the kind of general the general claim around the social recomposition I was highlighting through the four channels. And so then let's return to art. This 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 kind of alertness to new conditions and new possibilities to transformation is epitomized by contemporary art's characteristic premise of interpretation, as Danto most especially thematizes, and thematizes, I think, really clearly. But thanks to the CDS formatting of the social composition in general, this premise of contemporary art is now the basic operation of network sociality in general. All right? So that's what I mean by the retro transfiguration of the commonplace. What used to be something that art did, especially against other stuff that didn't do it, that's now happening everywhere. Network sociality requires the kind of operations that were once more or less restricted to the art space, uh, rather the contemporary art space. So this, this uh, premise of contemporary art ex extends across many dimensions of social composition, precisely by the kinds of CDS formats and transformations already outlined. In particular, interpretation, which if you remember, constitutes the primary act of contemporary art, epitomizes the requirement that the subject must navigate the construction of meaning making in every respect without security. Each person has their own interpretation and you always make a choice which speaks not just to your consumption through need, but to your signifying to others what you want it to mean, but also you demonstrate care, right? So every act is, an interpretation of what does this mean, both for myself and for others, in terms of the display of care. Which is not to be cynical about care, because care really matters. Right? It's environmental care and care for others as well. In these terms, contemporary art is typified by uh, post-conceptual sassiness, which is the cognitive moment, configured through signature stylization, the design moment, having a social dimension, the S moment, anchored in a subjective undertaking of experiential transformation, usually premised in an identity politics or in viable biographical testament. And that seems to me a universal definition of contemporary art. Post-conceptual sassiness, signature stylization, uh, social dimension through subjective, under, subjective transformation. Those are the three requirements, parameters of the contemporary artwork. And for everyone involved in contemporary art, not just of the artwork. The principal point of this talk is that this task, once identified with art in particular and with Danto specifically so in distinction from the commonplace, is now a required basis for CDS formats in general. It is a premise for engagement with the commonplace constructing of the commonplace constructed according to network networked socio-subjective conditions. which is just a rehearsal of the point I've now made several times. We can put this the other way. Contemporary art is a paradigm for the CDS recomposition of network global society and its subject. Contemporary art is then a channel of social validation, which is to say that it is now a relatively new kind of justification and practice of participation in channels of decentralized capital formation. In order to do well in a network, you need the social validation of the network. 
but you don't access capital unless you're in a network, and the, 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 the stronger or more uh, prominent you are in a network, the more access to capital you have. All kinds of capital, not just like money, but also reputational capital, further access, so on and so forth. So to, to um, do well in terms of network sociality is not just to do well in terms of individuation and network socialization, it's also to open up more capital. So the network sociality, the network sociality and contemporary art is a form of network sociality, depends upon social validation in the network, and that is a kind of justification and practice of participation in the network, and that's a way to access capital accumulation. People who don't do well in networks don't get much capital. So contemporary art is now subsumed to the, 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 the consequence of all of this is that contemporary art is subsumed to and no different from the imperatives of CDS composition of the network global social subject. And because access and engagement with networks is the condition for capitalization across the networks, as I've just said, the ubiquitous dynamic construction of uniqueness by CDS formats, including contemporary art, is a socially individuated dynamic of capital accumulation too, okay? The socially individuated dynamic of capital accumulation. So the, the important thing to understand in this in terms of uh, placing ourselves is that capital accumulation in network conditions doesn't mean me, me, me. It's not about individuation. One has to be socialized in network forms, which is to say, um, individuated through the network sociality in order to access the capital, right? So capital is, is now um, not about hoarding all the capital for yourself. It's about participating in networks in which capital can be accessed. But also you are part of that network. So your capital can be accessed by others. You share capital. So you have this weird combination of traditional claims around capitalism Privatized, privatized ownership of capital, and socialism, in which capital is shared out. Right? That's network sociality is this hybrid configuration, which is also why it's very hard to critique and why people who participate in it feel very good about doing so. Because they're kind of capitalist socialists. The retrotransfiguration of the commonplace, in short, is a mechanism for social and capital restratification on an aesthetico subjective basis. Okay. Aesthetics and subjectivity become a basis for accessing capital at different ways, and that's a stratification of capital. But the stratification of capital is what we've traditionally criticized as capitalism. Capitalism is now, through network sociality, um, constructed on an aesthetico subjective basis, which is exactly what contemporary art used as a premise for critique against capitalism of a previous time of industrialism. This restratification is already tangible today in the current justification of elites in the dynamics of CDS, taste, care, responsibility, rather than through old forms of distinction called on f calling on fixed traditions, not least through their tastefully declared patronage of contemporary art and contemporary art institutions. Uh, if you were in the workshop we did yesterday, this is the Peter Brand figure, okay, amongst many other patrons of contemporary art. Now the result of this common commonality between art and a CDS for is not, not, not much more to go. You'll be pleased to hear it's like, um, I think this is the bleakest moment. I'm not saying it's going to get less bleak. I'm just saying this is the, the, the we're plateauing at a level of bleakness. Uh, the result of this commonality between art and a CDS formatted commonplace is that artists making contemporary art make and do the same kinds of things found elsewhere in the CDS reconstruction of the broader social composition. Stuff, as Aurelia's students put it so well. But 
If art is stuff, stuff is not what it used to be. It's a bit like what art used to be. And stuff more precisely means a requirement for an experience that is personal, non-standardized, irreplaceable, differentiating, and authentic, unique, everywhere. But I think it's especially important to be clear here that the retrotransfiguration of the commonplace in which what was once specific to art is no longer specific to art, but a character is no longer characteristic of art alone, that this does not mean that art loses its defining distance in these new conditions, right? which would be the, the quick conclusion from this. Because art was defined, if you remember with Danto, by its distance from the commonplace. But if the commonplace is now doing arty kind of stuff, it seems that the distance is gone. Right? But I think that's the wrong conclusion to draw. Contrary to received criticisms of commodification, reification, or commercial transaction that posit the exceptionality of contemporary art from standard patterns of social totalization supporting capital accumulation, the distance that was once specific to art and definitional of it migrate across and characterizes the social spectrum altogether. It differentiates and separates the social from itself in general. So I think rather than the collapse of distance, the equality between art and stuff, the argument is rather because stuff is now artified, does the same things that contemporary art used to do. The argument is rather that, that, that this distance which separates the commonplace from itself is happening everywhere. Okay. Everything is a judgment and a display of subjective individuation. If for whatever reason then, you want to maintain that contemporary art continue to be specified against the rest of the supposed social totality, you would have to call the stuff that used to be called art an ex art. Right? Because the name art can't be maintained in distinction from the commonplace. But if you want to hold on to the name art, I think the only option is to call it ex art. It's what used to be art, but maybe can't be defined as distinctly art anymore. Ex art. So it's my ex. Like I had a relation, don't have a relation anymore, but I'm still kind of defined by that relation. Ex art does not mean the termination of art, contemporary art. It doesn't mean the interpretation, the, the termination of interpretation in art or elsewhere. Rather, ex art is just the CDS artifact continuing to be asserted in the historically sanctioned site of art, which for that reason, is now strongly validated rather than marginalized. Right? It's not that nobody wants an art college in their newly gentrified city. Everybody wants an art college in their newly gentrified city. It's not that the gallery is now in some rundown former dock area. The gallery is right now in the middle of the highly capitally intensive uh, development. Right? So as art becomes ex art, Exart is also strongly validated through capital development. Right? It's validated rather than marginalized. And this is, of course, the clear validation of galleries, contemporary art institutions, museums as venues, signifying the promotion of creative activity, which is central to these new forms of uh, capitalization. For all of the broad endorsement and affirmation contemporary art now enjoys, the days of being the rebel against some system over there are really over. Right. For all the broad endorsement and affirmation contemporary art now enjoys, the condition identified here can be put another way. From the side of art, contemporary art converts art into ex art, right, which is this, this slide. Affirmed by the retrotransfiguration of the commonplace as a site of generalized creativity of the network subject, contemporary art is not only the paradigm for the transfiguration of the commonplace as a demonstration of creativity and revision of meaning making, plastic form, structure, sociality, and subjectivity combined. It is moreover the transmission mechanism of art to ex art. Okay? I think we can sort of summarize the whole argument this way. This is Danto's claim. The commonplace is transfigured uh, into art, the yellow stuff. It's kind of uh, sideways cantified Rothko. Um, the retrotransfiguration is the way that art bleeds into 
uh, and reverses the the um, reverses how we engage with the commonplace. Okay, so the things that used to be in art are now happening everywhere. But the final move is this one, in which um, both art and the commonplace are a similar kind of stuff. So stuff extends into the commonplace. But what it does to art is it converts art into X art. Okay. So that's the, that's the kind of schema for the whole argument. Um, I could have just done that and saved you, <laughs> saved you, you know, sitting in a dark room on a sunny evening. And I think it's worth uh, closing. This, that, this is the kind of uh, diagnostic descriptive bit of the presentation. Um, the obvious question is how to meet this commonality of art and the commonplace brought about by the retro transfiguration of the commonplace. And I think four direct, uh, four distinct responses can be immediately offered. And I'll conclude with this. Firstly, you can just continue to keep going. And if you do this, Contemporary art continues in its more or less historically recognizable formats, practices, and institutional uh, configuration in order to maintain or protect what seem to be its advantages, which are, of course, criticality, semantic revision, subjective-centered creativity, participation, and other facets of art's prerogative, a counter to standardization and routinization. But to do this would be just to perpetuate the conditions described uh, in, in, you know, that I've been going on about for a little while now. Preserving with contemporary art, and there is no reason why, would one, why one should preserve contemporary art other than habit or for historical or sentimental reasons. Preserving with contemporary art continues the undoing of art specificity into X art. More contemporary art means more X art. I'm leaving these open as options. I think it's pretty clear which direction I would want to go in, but. The second option is reaction. And here, what one would do is to strive to re-secure the specificity of art against the broader convention, the broader conversion of the social processes to CDS formats, right? So it's kind of like, oh my God, this is terrible. We need to keep art special and distinct and exceptional to everything else. So we need to kind of find forms of art, ways of doing art, which don't, don't produce this problem. And we can do this by looking reactively to artistic paradigms prior to contemporary art, such as modernism, academicism, outsider art, and provincial styles, and so on. But the problem here is that because the continuity of art and CDS formats of socio-subjective formation in general are not primarily led by art, Right, as if you know, through the four channels I showed that this is happening elsewhere and art fits into this. Art is, contemporary art is still doing what it always did, but it's now in a different context, a different situation in which its effects are exactly the opposite of what they were meant to be by doing what it always did. Right? So because the continuity of art and CDS formats is happening for reasons external to art, this reclamation of art's histories does nothing to counter art's accommodation, contemporary art's accommodation into general conditions. It is instead the generation of more stuff that looks like art used to, right? It is art, capital A, art. The third option is abandonment. And this is simply to let art go, which I think somebody, you know, somebody earlier was talking about letting go. So here is an option. Just let it go, uh, as Elsa's. No, was it Elsa in Frozen? Uh, sorry, just. Um, so we can let art follow the tendency into the general social configuration of capitalization via CDS formats. If art is going this way, just just keep going. Right. A very a more aggressive variant of this position is to promote the demise of art. Actually, like force it, force it out. A more uh, a version, this would be a version of capitalist realism, which affirms that all social processes are only, force, are only uh, forces of capital accumulation and that everything else is a naive conceit. Right? We need to understand that contemporary art is only a type of capitalization. Everything else is just like 
uh, sort of trying to save something is something that's, um, that we cannot save. But I think this is an anti-art position, and it misapprehends that capitalism is itself under revision to formats that in fact endorse art, which is also to say that formats that endorse ex-art, and formats that in, uh, endorse creative destandardization, the very thing that's wanted by people who criticize capitalist realism, right? They're saying like capitalism is taking over the social space and we need to do something else because capitalism is the standardizing, routinizing thing. And that's a misidentification of what and how capital accumulation now happens. Recent formats of capital accumulation, CDS formats, have already moved past this criticism and the criticism is itself a residue of the history of critical art that it claims to trash. <coughs> the fourth option is contention. And here, the task would be to neither hold on to art, capital A art, or contemporary art, but also to not to abandon art's historical endorsement of critique meaning the transformation of meaning making through concepts, materials, and processes combined. What must now be emphasized is that if the revision of meaning in art is to support and develop the, count the countering of capital power, right? If, if it still does the things that we look to critique to do, which is to say capital domination produces huge sets of uh, really intractable problems, and this needs to be challenged, critique, but we need to understand capital producing those exploitations and inequalities and so on as it's now underway, not in its historical formats, then art can only do this if it counters the CDS format. Right? Art's got to do something else other than CDS. And not just counter the CDS format in its broader social formation through cities, critiquing cities, community, subjectivity, and the rest of it, it's also got to counter the CDS format in art itself. But CDS is the governing format of contemporary art in particular. Right? So the whole argument about retro transfiguration is the stuff that we look to, the, that contemporary art has historically done is CDS, which was once localized to art, but it's now generalized. And if we're gonna counter CDS, then we need to counter CDS within art itself. And that means contesting current modes of the social recomposition by and for capital accumulation. All of that requires countering contemporary art. Right, so we have to counter contemporary art. Which is to say that an art adequate to the historical demand of critique, because there's no need to do any countering or any other work if there's no critical ambition. Right? It's actually uh, much to the good of contemporary art just to let it go, the second option, and, and become stuff like everything else because there's a lot of capital accumulation to be had there, which makes sense of the inflation and the kind of uh, deepening of contemporary art um, and its, and its uh, public endorsement and media endorsement in recent years. But if we want to do crit critique, continue having art as a critical activity, we must now counter the very condition by which art is converted into X art. It must then be an art that counters contemporary art in particular, and not by looking back to previous moments of art, but by reformatting what art is and what art can be away from its commonality with CDS formats. And this requires an exit from contemporary art. Thank you. Hello, yes, so a couple of questions, maybe, perhaps. <laughs> so how do we do that? What, what counts as a counter? What, what is something, I mean, when I think about this, I, yeah. It's hard for me to envision something that isn't retroactive, that isn't re like returning to a Luddite-ness that 
um, would be a counter. So I want you to tell me, because I think you've thought about it a lot more than me. <laughs> um, I have some ideas. <laughs> um, I don't know. I guess initially, you, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, the cri basically, I think, I don't know. Um, I don't have a program at this point. Yeah. Um, I think that, <laughs> you think that's good? Yeah. Okay, I don't think it's good. I think it's a problem. Um, but, because I, I, I wish I did. I'd be the new Moses so far. Yeah. Um, now, I th in a way, I think if the argument has validity, um, there's already implied criteria by which we could understand whether something is doing contemporary art or whether it's doing something else, right? So the CDS thing for me is really, really important in terms of understanding what to do next or how to, how to um, engage with this problem. If you're doing work that's CDS work, I think it's just contemporary art, whatever the other claims are, right? So if, you want, if, if this does seem to me, if this, if this does seem to be uh, a convincing account and you want to maintain sort of some notion of critique that challenges sort of capital exploitation, blah, blah, um, like don't do CDS work, <laughs> but also don't do, you know, in the, four, in the four options, clearly number four is the one I'm interested in. Um, so don't do contemporary art, don't do art, right? So don't become a modernist or like impressionist or whatever, the Sunday painter. Uh, don't let art go and say, let's just give it up. Right? But also then to, to do a kind of work that does transform meanings, that, that um, challenges standard formats of capital accumulation as they now exist, um, but which doesn't go into CDS type of production. At this point, that's open. Um, my sense is that it would, rec uh, I mean, I think that's an initial an initial set of criteria. I think there can be other criteria as well. It would depend on what the interests of those involved in this would be. And I think those could be multiple because there are different types of uh, demands and repudiations of um, capital accumulation. Right? Or capital, the privatization of capital accumulation, let's say. Um, so, uh, I mean, it's a very long-winded way of saying I don't know. I don't, I don't have an exact answer of prescription, um, but I think prescriptions can be constructed. But for me, just to construct a criteria for art as, as um, affecting a change within this is already something different to contemporary art. Because contemporary art is no criteria. It's importantly criteria-less. Right? So this is, if, uh, I mean, elsewhere I've, I've argued that um, contemporary art, in fact, can be defined through indeterminacy like an indeterminacy of meaning making, okay? So one way to do it is to be, just to think about, well, what would it mean to have artworks that are quite determinate and prescriptive? And how do we validate that? Uh, in, what, in what ways do we validate that and in relationship to what other factors or conditions is, does that validation take place? To do all of that is already to not do contemporary art. But I don't think that we have the institutions in place and I don't think we have the common sense in place like a shared hegemonic kind of uh, sense of what art should be up to, to kind of provide the, provide the validation for that kind of work. Because if somebody does it, it would get dismissed as not doing the kinds of things we want art to do, which is interpretive work. So in the end, I think what I'd be interested in is art that, um, that effects rather than uh, invites interpretation, right? which is a kind of desubjectivized artwork. That's pretty good, right, as an initial response. Thank you. All right. Who's next? I'm happy to take questions of, like, what did you say? <laughs> well, good. That's, that's my question now. Now that I know that contesting the CDS is kind of the, the thing that you're pointing to, I'm wondering if you can flip back to the definition of CDS momentarily for just a little review. <laughs> Uh, this one? Yeah, this one. Okay. Oh, do you want me to speak to this? Yeah. Okay. I think you just wanted to look at the slide because it's such a great slide. Um, 
it's 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 one attempt to um, to kind of describe this retro transfiguration in terms of what's actually going on, right? Because um, in a way, we can you know, the, the argument about retro transfiguration necessarily builds on the transfiguration of the commonplace argument, um, but it, it it says that art is to do with interpretation. But then, what you're left with if you say retro transfiguration is just that the commonplace is itself full of moments of interpretation, right? Um, but interpretation doesn't seem to me to really capture the range of things that are going on in it. So I think what, what's going on with interpretation isn't just like, oh, how do I make sense of what I'm now engaged with, right? If I buy this phone as opposed to that phone, what does this show about me? Do I buy a product which I can recycle or not recycle? What does it say about me and what do I show to others implicitly? I don't know if people in Portland display their recycling bins to friends who come around and say, look, I've, I've, I'm sure somewhere that happens. Portland is a likely place for that to happen, I have to say. Um, so it, it's not necessarily like an explicit display to others, but a sense of social responsibility, just that. Okay? It's a demonstration of care. Um, and it's also, as a demonstration of care, it's that you are part of a social condition in which you participate as a caring agent. So that's, all of that is much larger than interpretation and involves many other factors. So I think that's what I'm trying to capture with CDS. There might be other, other things going on as well, but I think CDS is kind of uh, crude enough and direct enough to sort of get the core of it. Certainly as it involves the art field. So, um, so the, 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 the judgments that we make through interpretation, the thinking about what's going on, uh, the kind of, it doesn't have to be intellectual cognition, but a, a, a kind of reckoning of what am I doing when I buy this product, not that product. Uh, what is it, what does this artwork mean? I'm kind of drawing a continuity between those two activities. I think that's the cognitive moment. You have to think about what you're up to all the time. Right? Do, I, do I go to work by car? Do I take the bike? Do I take the bus? Those aren't just about time constraints, it's also about your concern for the environment. Right. That's, so those thoughts are in those kinds of very simple, practical decisions. The decorative element, the design moment, is that the, 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 the stuff that we engage with is designed in order to allow us to navigate through that decision making. Okay? So you can see this now with cars, where car manufacturers are kind of displaying the green credentials. And those green credentials are there as design, f design features to make us go this way rather than that way. Right? So the kind of subjectivities that we're, uh, uh, we're, we're um, constructing isn't quite the right term. The, the sort of subjectivities that are constructed in our engagement with objects depends on the design of the object. But also design elicits uh, decision on your part. Right, so the cognitive moment, the design moment, necessarily tied together. The design aspect is the sort of the object side, the cognitive moment is the subject side, but both of those are subsumed by this interpretive moment. Uh, and then the, the S moment is the network sociality, which is uh, when you do all of this stuff, you're doing it not just for yourself, but as an actor in a network, in, in this kind of um, social, you know, this is where the Relia quote is quite important. The, um, this one here, networks, um, you're neither under socialized nor over, you're basically individuated and socialized at the same time, which gets out of the deadlock between liberalism, the individual, and socialism, the collective, right? Networks are both of those at the same time. So they're a good solution to a lot of the political problems that dominated the 19th and 20th centuries. It's also why there's a lot of promotion of network type socialization, not just through Facebook and so on, but through uh, sort of um, social, um, like city ordering, city planning and so on. Um, and also through like cheap airfares, uh, the way business is constructed now, which is very networky, so on and so forth. Um, so those kinds of political deadlocks are surpassed by network socialization. And that's the, that's the, and I think that network socialization is also about 
part of being in a network is that you make decisions about how you're going to move next. The network is not pre-laid. As a network actor, you make the network, and you're part of the network that others are making. So it's flexible, adaptable, it shifts around. If you leave a network, you enter other ones, you're part of multiple networks. So they're always changing according to who the new actors are. It's like freelance work, essentially. Right? You're always kind of looking for the next gig, and people are looking for you for a gig. So LinkedIn is that kind of, that kind of argument. Um, and that's, that's, the, um, that's the sociality. The sociality then has to be constructed, and so the kind of sociality you have um, also signifies something according to the decisions you make. So that's the C moment and the D moment within the S moment. So it's not like any of these have priority. The kind of interlock as a unit. And that seems to me the kind of more expansive and uh, the fuller description of what interpretation is in the commonplace. Right, so it gets out of the, the you know, when we interpret a piece of work, the thing is over there, we're over here, or we're in an, Im an immersive environment, and you're doing some interpretive activity, and then you go to the bar afterwards and talk about it with others who have also interpreted. The, the, CDS, uh, the CDS configuration, it's much larger than just like object subject. It's a, it's, a, it's a way of being. But I think that's sort of contemporary art is a sort of um, locatable paradigm for that general condition. But insofar as it's a locatable paradigm, it also does those things. But we just isolate it into interpretation in that object subject way. But I think something else is going on. And, but it's not going on at the level necessarily of the encounter with the artwork. It's going on insofar as we're part of something called contemporary art. So if you're, if you're engaged in contemporary art, it seems to me very important to, <coughs> the focus has to shift, or the, the, um, the terms in with which we engage in contemporary art aren't just about what you think of the work. It's what is this work doing, or what am I doing engaging with this work within this larger CDS format, right? And the, the interpretation of the work is a kind of micro instance in an identifiable moment of something much greater that we do every time we do interpretive activity or engaging contemporary art. It's a bit like when you use your when you use your ATM card, you're engaging in financialization, even if you're just getting cash out, right? So the immediate transaction is just I want some cash, or you do the tap thing and then you get your coffee and off you go. But you're involved in a much larger infrastructure which you perpetuate by using those cards, and you don't really have a choice to perpetuate it. And that's a similar thing going on with the contemporary artwork, right? So if we repudiate CDS, we have to engage with art differently, but not just with the artwork, but actually what kind of art world, art system has been constructed. And they're the same thing. And at that point, so I'm going on a bit, but sort of um, it, it kind of all fits together miraculously. At that point, there's a demand on what the artwork is, as well as on how we engage with it, if it's not going to do CDS stuff. Art has to do something other than sort of invite CDS compositions. Are you saying art should be like hiding gold coins in your napkin? Hide, <laughs> art should be like what? Hiding gold coins in your napkin? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you are. I, no, I don't think I'm saying that. <laughs> um, hiding gold coins in your mattress would be um, option two. That would be capital A art, <laughs> right? Because that's like old school, things mean things before all this nasty network sociality stuff happened. I think part of it is that there, there are important gains to be had by network sociality. Right? We'd rather be on the side as you know, good lefty liberal types in contemporary art. We'd rather be on the side of network sociality than the kind of reactive moment. Um, so there are gains to be had. And the question is how you hold on to those gains without um, and, and maintain the task of critique. There's a question over there. Hi. Um, thanks for a great lecture. Really enjoyed it. Um, I'm not entirely sure what my question precisely is. But um, when I was introduced to art, I was always told that art is one that asks questions. And as I hear you, you describe an art that is rather assertive mm -hmm. and prescriptive, and one that perhaps um, causes effect. And I was wondering if people who have heard your lecture or read some of your material before have suggested or asked you whether it would look something like activism. 
Um, yes. <laughs> um, it, it's it's uh, it, there's there's a lot involved in in this, right? So, um, like, let's think about what the standard objection is to activism within contemporary art as a as a premise, and then I'll go on to say why activism provides you know th there's something around activism. Um, uh, Activism is rejected in contemporary art because it, it's like it's very like you know what you have to get on with, right? And contemporary art doesn't do that kind of thing. It's about revision, asking questions. So so activism is a bit too doctrinaire and dogmatic, um, and also it's not interested in. Well, it's not that it's not interested. Its priority is otherwise than the subjective engagement with. I mean, if you think of activism and interpretation like a rich, you know, deep interpretation, very different types of activity, right? So activism gets uh, repudiated within contemporary art quite frequently. Uh, and it's certainly the commonplace in art teaching that if somebody's trying to do something very directly in your face activist, it's kind of not here. <laughs> or if you want to address an activist issue in contemporary art through contemporary art means standard criticism, just go and become an activist and get out, get out of the room, okay? Which seems to me a shame because activism is trying to do political transformations which actually are very similar to some of the standard critical claims of contemporary art. So they should be very close to one another, but there's something that uh, within contemporary art, which I think is the demand or the priority of interpretation, which leads to the repudiation of activists as activists. Right? It's generalizations. But I think it's, a, it's a, because it's a theoretical argument, it's important to generalize. Um, so I think what I'm, insofar as that interpretive moment is like the manifestation of CDS within contemporary art, and I'm saying, let's get rid of the CDS stuff, it seems to me that we could invite some, and so I think this comes back to, to like the, uh, the, the answer to the first question. I think we could invite something or like endorse activist type stuff within this exited, not contemporary art type of art, this art that's not contemporary art. Um, but the issue would be whether the activist claims, the thing about critique is it's, it's interested in changing, in changing meanings, and changing meanings in order to change things. Right? That's, that's what the critical activity is. So the question is whether the, activ the, the, the onus then would be on the activism. Is, the ac is it an activism that changes meanings? Or is it an activism that um, keeps keeps the standard format of meanings going from one side rather than the other side, okay? So if you're Antifa, Antifa, I think it's, you say over here, right? If you, if you do Antifa stuff, it's important that you're not going, oh, well, what is a Nazi? Hmm, <laughs> I don't know, let's think about that a little bit. Maybe they're not so bad. Uh, no, that's not gonna work. It's important to be out there like doing whatever you have to do. I'm not gonna endorse violence, but against a Nazi, it's, I mean, um, so sometimes with activism, you don't want to like mess around with the meanings of things because you take one side rather than the other side. It's kind of partisan activity. But I, th I think this, m this might be another answer to like what would this stuff look like? What would be an activism which is also about the transformation of meanings as a kind of critical activity? What is a critical activism, right? And actually I think that's something that art can be really good at but it's got to give up all this interpretation stuff because the changing of meanings has to be affected. Like you've got to enter into institutions. You've, you've, got to, you've got to move within not just art institutions, but broader institutions, government, finance, so on and so forth. Those are the sites of intervention, so they don't keep going as they always have. Right? Sorry. I don't know if there's a question. I didn't hear the question. Oh, sorry. Could that um, something like institu institutionalizing your assertions? Um, you're actually taking a yeah. stand on things and you're trying to institutionalize that. Yeah, and so there's a kind of positive relationship to institutions rather than we do the art stuff and the institution is just this unfortunate venue or things that, things that arrives afterwards, which kind of crushes the unique subjectivity of the artist. All that stuff, just let it go. Well, not let it go, just get rid of it. <laughs> Remove yourself from that. One, you, I think, I think part, my, my interest, I guess, again, to come back to the first question, my interest is what would art be if it takes its institutionalization seriously and if it can expand its institutional um, engagement beyond the art institutions? 
I think this is why it's not institutional critique. Right? Institutional critique is like, oh, art is in institutions. Ugh, what does that mean? We're capitalized, we're museumified, blah, blah, blah. Let's make some work, which is like, well, we are, but we shouldn't be. Maybe we are, and we're all kind of like horrible for it. Like, just forget it. Like, the institutionalization of art is a prime venue for intervention. And it's, it seems to me, if the, if the, if the retro transfiguration of the commonplace, if the CDS format is uh, common between art and the city, the community, the subject, and commodity, it means that art can act on all of those from the side of art if it goes through the institutions, right? So rather than saying like, oh, it's really unfortunate that, um, uh, you know, intensive capital development of urban spaces puts galleries in there, needs art schools to show creative capital and so on and so forth. Actually, if you're in an art school, uh, if you're in an art school in the middle of one of these developments, what do you do? Do you do, you, do, you do the CDS stuff, which is the thing that's kind of want, expected of you? Or do you act through the institution to effect, because there's power attached to this, right? If you're an institution, you're a power actor. So what kind of powers are there within the art field which are accessible and available if you choose, if you, if you take them on? And it seems to me artists don't want to do that for the most part. And if you do take on the power, then you're an activist. Right? But you're an institutionally organized activist. I think there are real, there's real possibilities for effecting the kinds of transformations that critique and art have historically claimed or desired, but then always gone like, oh, we can't do it because we just do art and we shouldn't like, no, 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 no. A sort of paraphrase a kind of complex set of discussions. You are describing a current condition, and I wonder if you can point to any particular moments over the last century of change or social development that have brought us here. Like, how, how did this come about? Oh, that's another, <laughs> that's a whole other talk. Um, you know, I, I, I mentioned, might, I mentioned might Soho, Manhattan Soho in the 70s. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of paradigmatic moment for gentrification. Um, so it's a deindustrialized area, clothing manufacturing, deindustrialization, Hong Kong, Taiwan, doing that much cheaper, people are pulling out, George McCunis and others move in, Fluxus sets up in the 60s and so on. Um, and so there's a kind of increasing, like this, the, I mean, because of New York is bust as well. There's no capital, so it's a kind of unique moment where they move in and they produce a kind of thriving uh, cultural scene, which then becomes a center for uh, a recapitalization of Manhattan, of lower Manhattan. Um, and what do the artists do? They hold on to their lofts and they complain about it. And then they move elsewhere. They move to Lower East Side and the rest of it. And then it happens there and then they complain about it. And then at that point, by, you know, by the time Lower East Side in the 90s, it's too late for artists to be able to afford this stuff. So you move out to Brooklyn. And it's happened again in Brooklyn. And artists complain about it and then move to Queens. And they complain about it and then move out to it. And so it carries on in that process. Um, so that's one example, similar, I mean, gentrification seems to me like the key example, because their art has had very, very uh, serious and large effects within cities, uh, which cities have then instrumentalized, right? But, but as soon as you say instrumentalized, everybody kind of throws their hands up in horror and runs away, because not what artists do. But actually, you turn it around, artists can do quite a lot with cities and to cities, if they understand what their power is in relationship to what are now standard formats of gentrification. You can change directions. You can put up stoppages, blockages, but you can also do other types of development because the developers are interested in what art does to cities. And I think that's beginning. There are some projects that start to understand the capacities of art as a power actor within the institutions of uh, really big amounts of capital finance and property development. 
And the question is whether that can be shifted in directions that are more just, not absolutely just, because those actors won't be that interested in absolute justice, but it would be up to the artist to kind of do something with that set of interest in what art is up to. But it's not gonna do it by sitting there interpreting artworks or kind of resorting to the subjectivity of those involved. So the, 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 the problem that contemporary art, I think it's specific to contemporary art, so it's the last 50 years or something. The problem with contemporary art as opposed to modernism is that contemporary art says that the, the horizon and the limit of what we do with art is the subject and how they make meanings as a creative entity, independent, like, situated in, but independently of the institutionalizations and social formats that they're in, right? And that's, that's clear in the construction of the engagement with art, and it's clear in the social uh, organizations and standard discourses of art, the ideologies, but it's also clear in how art deals with, contemporary art has dealt with its institutionalization, which is pathetically. Like institutionalization happens to contemporary art. Those who do well out of it have to take advantage of it, and those who don't do well out of it, and continue it, and it's, and it's so the well-to-do artists, the ones who you know, are significant, held to be significant artists, kind of happy to carry on about it, carry on with it, complete with the standard critical claims by which they got there, and those who don't do well out of it complain about it, and that's it, <laughs> that's, that's, that's really inadequate. It's really inadequate. Both sides are kind of powerless against an institutionalization which is inflicted upon art and artists. And this is just really not good enough, especially given the engagement of contemporary art with very much larger forces. And then the elephant in the room, the word that hasn't been mentioned all day, uh, I mean all evening, but was been talked about all day is of course uh, neoliberalism which is the structure and the sort of formation of all these relationships and the formation of the individual, the formation of uh, understandings of contemporary art, more or less. Yeah, I think, I, I mean, the, the way to um, uh, introduce, I mean, the way to introduce neoliberalism is basically, well, there's two moments. The creative class is a neoliberal class, um, but it's also the argument against, um, let me find the slide. Um, but, but yeah, I guess that the, the, the CDS argument is, is actually an argument about neoliberal social cultural construction, right? So CDS is anti-routinization, it's de-standardization and so on. And I think what's very important to understand about neoliberalism as a specific, specific form of capital or cap organization or capital accumulation, it's a long-winded we saying capitalism, but I think it's importantly long-winded. What's, what's important about neoliberalism as a specific form of that thing um, is that it, it, it's, it's, it thrives through destandardization and individuation, right? So one of the problems we have when we, when we do sort of, um, it's not just restricted to art schools and art education. I think it's quite common in critical humanities that Neoliberalism is taken as yet another form of capitalism. The standard model of what that means through the historical critiques of capitalism is standardization, routinization. It's kind of an industrial model, but neoliberalism is doing something really different, right? So the, the thriving, the thriving um, uh, intersection and overlap and feeding off one another in somewhere like Soho, Manhattan, between shopping, high-end finance, the art scene, similar thing in Berlin, similar thing in most art cities. That's a specifically neoliberal composition, right? It's not about the massified industrial worker who's anonymous. Like those pictures are, those images of, uh, are kind of finished in the richer countries. So I think, I think in, in a way, you know, the, the, the discussion of the CDS and the four channels of it, those are, um, if you want, specific venues of neoliberal reorganization but it's a kind of sociality of neoliberalism rather than the economic structures. So maybe one more quick comment before we all go home and drink beer. We could go out and talk about what I meant. <laughs> okay.
Yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks so much, Julia. All right, thank you.